Hey guys, and welcome in. So today we are going to be doing an IFR flight from Seattle, excuse me, not Seattle, Chicago to Pittsburgh today. So if you watched my previous video, uh, we did an IFR flight during a sunny day because I just wanted to show the methods and procedures that I use. But as you can see today, we have a lot of, uh, lot of fog, as well as by the time we land in Pittsburgh, it's going to be dark as well. So before we get started here, I wanted to make a couple quick notes. So first off, first and foremost, I am not an expert. So instead of saying what I like to do is a thousand times, like I did in my first video, when I say to do something, for example, set your flaps to five, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the correct thing to do. It's just what I do personally. So if you're trying to use this as a guide to pass like a real life exam, probably a bad idea. Now if you're trying to impress the hot girl in the apartment across from yours with your sweet pilot skills, you've come to the right place. Alright, so one last feature I wanted to point out is that we are going to be starting from cold and dark here. So as you can see our airplane is in a off and quote unquote cold state. The engines are off and everything. So we're going to be starting up basically from the very beginning and getting this plane flying. Uh, as you can see, we're flying with United today just because uh, Chicago to Pittsburgh is a frequent uh, route, route that United covers. So that's why I chose United for this flight. So um, yeah, uh, once we enter the cockpit, we are going to be staying there for the entire duration of the flight. Uh, basically, I wanted to do so just to add to the sense of realism. Obviously, pilots and you know can't view their plane from the outside like we are at this point. So once we enter the cockpit, we will not be exiting the cockpit until the flight is over with. All right, I think I babbled enough, so let's go ahead and get started here. All right, so the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to come up here and you're going to switch your ground power switch to off. You're going to go up a little further, and this is the battery switch right here. We're going to go ahead and flip that on. We're going to come down and flip on our three hydraulic pumps, which are these three switches right here. So that's one, two, and three. Down here, we're going to go over to our APU switch and switch it to start. And then these three switches right here, which are our generator switches, go ahead and switch all three of those on. So that's one, two, and three. So as far as our lights go, we're going to turn on our anti-collision light, our logo light, and a couple of the other lights, which is the wheel well, and this one is the wing light switch. All right, so at this point, I would normally tune the ATIS to listen to the weather report, but because it's basically going to be a lot of talking and I'm going to still be talking, it's just going to come across as a jumbled mess of a lot of words and you might not catch a lot of what I'm saying. So I'm not going to do that right now, but I would normally tune the ATIS with the, uh, to check on the weather and the arriving and departing runways and, you know, precipitation winds, things of that nature, but I'm not going to do that right now. All right. So at this point, I think we can go ahead and get the engine started here. So the process to do that is you're going to come to the starter switches, which are these two right here. You're going to turn on the starter. Then you're going to come up to the fuel pump for that particular engine. Since we're doing the right one first, we're going to do right starter, right fuel pump. And then you're going to come down here to this switch right here. You see these two switches. And once that N2 number hits 20, since we're doing the right engine, we'll be doing this one right here. Um, once that number hits 20, you go ahead and flip this switch right here, and it comes to life. So here, I'll show you. It's a lot easier than it sounds. Okay, so we're going to do starter switch. And you hear that sound? Fuel pump, you should hear that sound too. And then we're watching until that number hits 20. There we go. So you come back up and shut the fuel pump off and the starter switch off. And then we're going to do the same thing for the other side. So starter switch, fuel pump. 
waiting for that number to get to 20. Alright, there we go. So come back up and shut the fuel pump off and the starter switch back to off. And our engines are running. So at this point, we can go ahead and contact air traffic control to start getting our, uh, our flight clearance here. All right, so we're not going to do that quite yet just because we have a couple more things we need to set up here. So we did get cleared for 11,000 feet. So what we're going to do with that number here is we're going to enter that into the altitude on our autopilot. So 11,000. And as far as during our flight plan or what you prepare before you actually start the flight is you do your flight planner and it asks you what altitude basically you want uh, your plane to be cruising at and the rule of thumb is well it's not a rule of thumb it's actually an official rule well a rule of thumb might be an official rule but basically if you're flying east the number needs to be odd so it needs to be 25,000 27,000 29,000 I've set our cruising altitude today for 31,000 but if you're flying west it needs to be even, so 22,000, 24,000, 26,000. The way I remember it is even sounds like it should be east, like they almost sound like similar words. So east is even, but it's not that. So it's east is odd, west is even. All right, as far as our ascent rate, I'm going to go ahead and set this at 4,000. And remember, this is just for the beginning of the flight. Obviously, that number is going to decrease as we get higher up, but that's just for the start of the flight here. So anytime you're under 10,000 feet, you're not allowed to go over 250 knots. So I like to set this for 250. And then obviously once we get above 10,000 feet, we'll bump that number up as well. And then you can turn your auto throttle switch on as well. Your flight director switch, which gives you those uh, pink crosshairs on your display screen here. So we'll go ahead and turn that on as well. And then for the course number, I'm not really exactly sure what the common use of this is, but what I like to do is, sorry about that phrase. So uh, go ahead and press Shift F10, and that's gonna bring up this little block. And then I like to go to the nav log here, and you see under heading, It'll say what the heading is from basically what airport you're at to the one you're flying to. And that's what I like to put in there, at least at the beginning. And you'll see how it progresses as we go forward through the flight that I, it, I change it every now and then. But just for the start, that's what I do. Okay, so it looks like our autopilot is all set up the way we need it to be at this point. So we can go ahead and turn our auto brake to rejected takeoff. And then we're also going to set our flaps to five. So that's one, two, and five. Let's see if I can turn on the panel lights here, make it a little easier to see. There we go. All right, so I think we can go ahead and uh, get our taxi clearance here while we pull back the jetway and shut the door, which is control J to pull back the jetway and shift E to open and shut the door. Chicago ground, United 3572 heavy with kilo ready to taxi IFR. United 3572 heavy taxi to and short of runway 14 left via taxiway hotel Romeo Echo Papa Papa. 
All right, and I like to use the progressive taxi personally. You don't have to, but it's pretty difficult without it, so I like to use it. All right, so go ahead and flip on your fasten seat belt sign lights and the no smoking lights as well, since we're pretty much ready to go here. So we're gonna go ahead and flip on our taxi light. And then we're going to look around and see if we can see our yellow arrows for our the progressive taxis. So I don't see them back there. So I'm guessing they're probably going to be behind us and to the right. So what we're going to want to do is push back and back to the left. So to do that, you're going to hit Shift P. And then immediately after, you press 1. You would press 2 if you wanted to go back to the right. But since we're going, going to go back to the left, we're going to do Shift P and then 1. So, period to release the parking brake, and then we're going to do shift P1. And then you'll see here how this card will take us back a little bit, and then we'll start turning to the left. Always do your best to make sure you're clear, because the little trucks like that, they're all over the place, and they do not care at all. They will run into you no problem. And then you just hit Shift-P to stop your pushback, and then Shift-P, and then 1 again to restart the pushback. And then if you just wanted to go straight backwards, you would just press Shift-P. And you don't want to go too far back just because those little carts, uh, they come out of anywhere and they are, they will run right into you, like I said. So go ahead and hit Shift P. And then you're going to want to set your parking brake. And sometimes this little cart will be invisible. And if that's the case, then you don't have to wait for him. But since he is visible today, um, you do have to give him a little bit of time, about. I don't know, like 45 seconds to a minute to allow him to <laughs> weirdly back up like that and clear the airplane before you start going forward. So, And always whenever you're stopped, just try and get into the habit of setting your parking brake just because you don't want to go rolling backwards or forwards without uh, being in control or being aware of such. All right, so now we can start gently and very slowly increasing the throttle. So you don't want to go over 20 knots while you're taxiing, and you'd be surprised at how quickly you reach 20 knots while taxiing. So the good, uh, it's just good to keep an eye on it, your speed, pretty frequently while doing this, just to be safe. Okay, so make sure no, no little truck's about to run into us. Alright, so as far as keeping the airplane level, do you see the little red square and the orange square below that's in the center of uh, the dash here that says the red square says fire warn and the orange square or yellow square says master caution? So in between those two blocks is the center of the airplane so you can see that I'm trying to keep the yellow arrows centered in between those two squares because that is the center of the airplane and that's very useful uh, and not only pretty important for not only takeoff but landing as well to remember that that's the center of the airplane even though it doesn't look like it because you want to stay on the center as much as possible Okay, let's see. Let's go ahead and glance at my speed. So I'm going 16 knots. So I can go a little quicker, but not too much.
Okay. And we are almost there. So you can go ahead and probably start killing the throttle at this point. And then if you do have to use the brakes to stop. Oh, I guess we got a little further to go. Never mind. But if you do have to use the brakes to stop, not the parking brake, like the standard brakes, make sure you just pump them gently. Don't just, like, hold them. I'll show you what I mean when we get to uh, the hold short line. However far away that may be. Yeah, see, the fog is really setting in here. And this is why it's so crucial to have IFR capabilities. Just because you're not always going to be able to see the runway. And taking off, obviously, that's not so bad. Obviously, I think the people at the, uh, what was it, Tenrith Airport might disagree. But, uh, it's very crucial when landing that you are able to see the runway, or if you're not able to see it, that you're lined up properly using your instruments. Because even just being just a bit misaligned can have really significant consequences so being able to do a uh, IFR flight is very very important and you'll see that it's really not that much different from a visual rules flight oh my goodness this is quite the taxi <laughs> I think we're just about there. I've never been to the uh, Chicago airport personally, so I can't attest to what this is like in real life, but I'm, it's a pretty big airport as far as I know. Where did our progressive taxi go? I think it just went to the end of this part. I think that's the runway we're going to be taking off here just to our right. I guess my tokens for having the progressive taxi ran out. Alright, and here's the point when you're coming up on a turn that you can probably kill the throttle. And then if you do it right, you shouldn't really have to use your brakes at all. But it can be tricky at times. Like sometimes you might not have enough juice and... Oh, see, we got a plane coming in right now. Yep, there he comes. And that's a pretty good example of why you also want to be efficient when you're... Uh, interacting well at all times but especially when you're interacting with the runway and now that's not the same as rushing but staying efficient as far as Tower, United, three, five, taking care of everything you need to take care of in a timely manner basically no wasting time All right, and at this point, while we wait for the Airbus to clear the runway, we're going to go ahead and shut our taxi light off. We're going to turn our landing lights and takeoff lights on. And then we're going to turn our strobe light on as well. All right, here we go. Cleared for takeoff, runway one four left, United three five seven two heavy. All 
All right, and remember what I said about the center of the airplane with the red and orange squares. So you're gonna use that to line yourself up on the runway with the center line. And then before you stop, you should have an idea that you're not only lined up properly, but also pointing the correct direction too. Just because when you start getting going, you're not going to be wanting to do a lot of, if any, turns to the left or right. So you want to try as best you can to get make sure that you're situated properly before you start your takeoff roll. Okay, I think that should be good right there. So you're going to go ahead and set your parking brake. And then we need this screen and this screen right here. So we do one last glance at everything to make sure we're good to go. We got our auto brake on reject to take off. Flaps are set to five. Our autopilot is all set up. Uh, fasten seat belts, no smoking lights are on. And I think oh, we are good to go. So you're gonna go ahead and spool your engines up to 40. This number right here is gonna be 40. And then as soon as it hits 40, you're gonna release the parking brake. And then you're gonna go smoothly up to 95. See how even though it looked like I was centered, I wasn't. And that can be a little tricky sometimes. And that's why I like to go 95 instead of 100, because you can go a little over like I have, and you're still not redlining the engines. All right, so at about 145, 150, you're gonna slowly pull back on the joystick and off into the air. And then you're gonna pull back, you're gonna wanna retract your landing gear as soon as you clear the runway, just cause that will make you crash if you don't. And then we're gonna pull our flaps back all the way. We're gonna shut off our auto brake. We're going to turn on our speed here as well as our autopilot systems. Going to one, three, three point one, United three, five, seven, two, heavy. Chicago departure, United three, five, seven, two, heavy. This is climbing through two thousand eight hundred for one, one thousand. United three, five, seven, two, heavy. Chicago departure, Roger. Altimeter, two, nine, or eight, three. United three, five, seven, two, heavy. Turn left. All right, so we've been instructed to go to 105, so you put 105 here in the autopilot and click that button below it. Turn left heading 105, resume on navigation, climb and maintain 11000, United 3572, heavy, hybrid 445, contact Chicago, departure on 118 point, United 3572, heavy, contact Chicago, approach on 118 point, four, Cessna 191. Contact Chicago. Approach on 118.4. Going to 118.4. United 3572 heavy. Going to Chicago. Approach United 3572 heavy. Is climbing through 6,900 for 11,000. United 3572 heavy. Chicago. Approach Roger. Altimeter 2983. Chicago. Approach Cessna November 17191. United 3572 Heavy, contact Chicago Center on 120.35, Cessna November 17191. And then as you get closer, since we're only cleared for uh, 11,000, you'll want to reduce this number. Just you want the, it to be a little less drastic as far as once you um, reach out to dude, you don't want it to like plateau like that. And you're gonna to want to do that basically whenever you're ascending or descending. Okay, since we're over 10,000, we can go ahead and boost the speed up. As well as shut off our landing lights.
and then to make sure your barometer is correctly set, you just press B on your keyboard, and you can do that whenever. All right, and we've been cleared for flight level 230, so 23,000 feet. And then sometimes if in that situation, I don't know if you saw for a second, but when I was increasing the altitude, even though the vertical speed since 2000, it wasn't doing that, you sometimes just have to pre adjust this once and it'll kick it back into gear. And you'll want to keep an eye on your speed here as far as your ascent rate, since I just bumped it up to 3500 just because we've still got plenty of speed and we're not dropping speed or anything like that. You kind of want to make sure that number stays above 200. Just as a good rule of thumb. You'll notice as we get higher up that the it's going to start decreasing. As soon as you hit 18,000 feet, you'll want to hit B on your keyboard because once you hit 18,000 feet, that number changes to 29.92 at all times. And during uh, sunny days, it's usually not as big a deal because it's almost above and below the line. It's always almost 29.92. But on days, like especially where it's like stormy, where there's a lot of pressure changes, you'll want to make sure to keep an eye on that frequently. Because you'll see once I change it, once it hits 18,000 feet, you'll notice that the altitude meter jumps because of the uh, the changes in pressure and what that might mean for your altitude. So as soon as we hit 18,000 feet. And that's B as in boy. There we go. So now we're at 2.92. Okay. So we still got a pretty good amount of speed here. So now it's starting to drop a little quicker. Plus we're getting closer to our 23,000, so we can probably bring that down by 700. So now we're at 28, uh, 2,800 feet ascension per minute. United 3572 heavy. Contact Chicago Center on 127.55. 127.55 for United 3572 heavy. Chicago Center. And then once this number right here gets under zero degrees, I like to go ahead and turn the engine anti-ice switch on, which is this one right here. Don't do the wing anti-ice, just do the engine anti-ice. And then if you wanted to do the pitot tubes as well, you can. Those are more important if it's winter on the ground, but since it's fall right now and it's cold up here, might as well. It doesn't hurt to turn them on, so might as well, because that gives you all your uh, all your instrument readings, and that can cause uh, serious problems if, for whatever reason, those are frozen over or anything like that. So, okay, so we're almost to twenty-three thousand, so we can go ahead and reduce that a little more to make it a little more even, like I said. Okay, and this is our last uh, our last altitude climb. Once we reach that, we will be set for the flight. So if you wanted to pull up your GPS, you go ahead and hit Shift 3. And then since we're pretty near our flight plan here, it hasn't instructed me to change. But if you want to change from your own navigation to the flight plan, basically the GPS taken care of, 
what you do up here is you switch this switch to GPS and you press V O R L O C and you'll see that went out and now that's lit. And now you'll see that the plane is turning us slightly because now it's going to go along that magenta fly along that magenta line. So essentially basically takeoff and landing are really the only things that I like to do for the most part with the nav. And then as far as once we get up in the air and kind of heading toward our cruising altitude, I like to switch on the GPS so it uh, flies along our flight plan. And then that will also give you your distance as far as how far it is to where your, uh, where your destination is. So see uh, that 314 right there, that's 314 miles, I believe, uh, to Pittsburgh from where we are. And then see at this point, if you wanted to, you can go ahead and change the course. Uh, since it looks like we're all at 96, if you wanted to, you can go ahead and turn this to 96 too. Doesn't hurt if you don't though. But it'll line up that uh, that pink bar, which is kind of your flight plan bar, more perpendicular with what you're trying to do. All right, so it looks like we're getting close to 200, so we're gonna go ahead and reduce our vertical speed a little bit, just to ensure that we don't get under 200. And we're still dropping a little bit, so I'll still bring that down a little more. And it's not the end of the world if you get under 200, it's just better safe than sorry. Stay above 200 and you'll be golden. Once you get under 200, then that kind of starts getting to a situation where you might possibly end up in a stall. Like, basically anything. It's, it's probably more like 160, 150 when you start really getting into stall range. So it's not, like, again, like I said, it's not like right at 200 you're going to crash, but just easier to keep it above that. And I see a lot of people that one of the time when they see it's like over speed is 320 knots or whatever, and they're like, I thought they could almost, you know, go like 500 knots or whatever. And it's people don't remember that there's a difference between ground speed and air speed. Because even though that says, uh, and since we're almost at 31,000, we can reduce the vertical speed significantly. Plus, since we're almost at 200, we want to do that as well. And you'll see that even though that says 206, if you go to shift 3, down here in the bottom, that's the ground speed we're going right now. So, And then you'll see once we actually get up to our cruising speed, because we're going a lot slower than we will be once we level out. And now that we're at our cruising altitude, we can go ahead and shut our seatbelt lights off. Smoking light has to stay lit, unfortunately. So now that we've flattened out, you can see we're picking up speed here. As well as our number here for our 46 minutes is going to come down quite a bit since that's based off of our what our ground speed is. But since we're gaining quite a bit of speed at this point, you'll see that number is going to come down. And this number isn't always going to be right at 300. It, there's a lot of variables to it as far as like pressure, type of weather, uh, the weight of your airplane, the wind, things of that nature. So it's not always going to be right at 300. But basically, I like to set my speed at whatever is 
just at the bottom of that yellow bracket. If you go inside of it a little bit, that's okay, but I wouldn't go more than a notch inside the yellow bar. Because when you hit the red, that's your overspeed, so might as well not not push it because you risk damaging the engines as well as the structural integrity of the airplane and there's no point in going any faster than this. So right at the bottom of the yellow little bracket thing right there is a good rule of thumb. And the little the little pink blocks and arrows and stuff that's basically what you have your autopilot set as. So since it were set at 300 up here you can see it's pointed right there. And then since our altitude is set at 31,000 feet right there, you can see that pink block. And then right down there is since we're, our GPS is set for 108, uh, you can see it right there. And then that's what also these green, three green are for speed, uh, horizontal location, and altitude. Since all three of those are lit, that means all three of those factors are being controlled by the autopilot at the moment. Like if I was to shut the speed off, for instance, you would see that light go out. All right, and we are just about up to our cruising speed here. It is dark already. Alright guys, so at this point, you're basically just monitoring all your systems. Uh, everything looks good, engines look good, autopilot's doing its thing. So, at this point, you're kind of just keeping an eye on things, as well as making sure you transfer between the uh, radio stations, that's the main thing you're going to be doing, doing the transfers from area to area. So I'm going to go ahead and cut away here, and I will be back when it is time to land. See you in a minute. All right, and we are back. All right, so go ahead and get your fast and seatbelt light back on. And then we're going down to 250. So you can go ahead and pull back on the throttle a little bit. I like to go down to 270. And then I found that 2200, uh, your descent rate, 2200 feet per minute, is about as steep as you can go without triggering a sink rate alarm. And even then, it still does happen sometimes, but we'll see how it goes. And you can also go ahead and put out uh, flaps too. So one and two. And then periodically you'll see me uh, opening up the air traffic control menu. Once every couple of minutes, just kind of like as one of my checks, just because sometimes if they ask you to change your station and then you acknowledge it but don't actually change it, there won't be anybody that comes on and says, hey, did you change yet? So you might be sitting there waiting for some information to come and, and nobody's talking and you're wondering why. So that's why I bring it up once every couple of minutes just to make sure. It's pretty clear up here, but as we get lower, obviously you can see um, we're going to be entering back into the fog. Cleveland 
and remember since we're close to our 25,000 feet we can go ahead and reduce the uh, descent rate. And as soon as we get to 25,000, it should clear us for a further descent. But not always. Well, well, eventually, but not immediately. Oh, yep, there we go. Reduce our speed a little more. Go ahead and just go down to 260. And then keep in mind it's the same deal as when we went above 18,000. Once you get below 18,000, remember to hit B as in boy to uh, correctly set your barometer. Or you can come up here and do it the manual way, but. If you're like me, you probably like the lazy way. So yeah, just press B and it'll set it pro properly for you automatically. I like this uh I like this co-pilot. He's a good guy. Solid. Doesn't really talk much though. As a first officer, he mostly keeps to himself. Oh, that's right, we're uh, united. Sorry, we're not Southwest. I shouldn't be cracking jokes. As uh, Boom Howard from King of the Hill once said, just fly the damn plane. Alright, so we go ahead and switch that to 80, and then we switch back to nav and heading select at that point. So we're back on navigation here. And then remember, you have to switch from VR, VOR LLC to heading select to be back properly on navigation. Okay. And then he did also give us our runway, so ILS runway 10 left. So what we do at this point is we open up our GPS and we go over to this page right here and we're going to enter in the short code which is KPIT for Pittsburgh and then you hit enter and then you go over to this screen right here and we're going to scroll down and we're looking for 10 left on the ILS. So that's that right there. So that's 111.70. So you come down here to your nav 1, and you change this to 111.70, or whatever number it needs to correspond with whatever uh, airp airport you're landing at. Then don't forget to switch it to active, because it's on standby. So you switch it to active. And then if you want, you can also press this button right here, which gives you the Morse code notification once you're in the uh, in that particular frequency's range. I like to do it, just as a confirmation. 
Oh, see, we're under 18,000, so B. And then our barometer's correctly set here. Since we're over zero here, we can go ahead and shut off our engine anti-ice and our pitot tubes if you wanted to, but you don't have to. And since we're getting close to 13,000, we can go ahead and uh, reduce our rate of descent. Keep going. So 5,000. Here's a good example. So even though it says 1,000, see how it's not going 1,000? You have to press one adjustment and then it'll start going again. Okay, and since that's going to bring us under 10,000 feet, we're going to go ahead and drop our speeds under 250. Let's do 240 for now. Or 235 works. So 115. And then since we're getting close to 10,000 feet, we can go ahead and turn our landing lights on. Let's bump that back up to 240, actually. Yeah, see, now we're back in the fog. It's pretty difficult to make out anything. Oh, there's some town down there. It, it doesn't hurt to double check this number right here because it needs to be correct for the ILS to uh, assist you with the approach. And if you don't have it correct, you're in a world of hurt. So that's 111.70. We have 111.70, and it is only active for NAV1. And since it's at 10 left, uh, so the runway is probably going to be facing that way, like cutting perpendicular across that purple magenta line. 
So I'm guessing at some point, I think it's going to have us cut this way and then left. And then there's our uh, Morse code notification, that, so that means we are in the uh, vicinity. And then you'll see here that some this screen is starting to pop up with information as far as uh, connected to the ILS frequency. So as you'll notice, as we get closer to the airport, more and more things on the screen are going to start coming to life. That's exactly what I was talking about. All right, at this point, we should be able to put out flaps five. given us quite the zigzag route today. Let's take a look and see how, about how far away we are. Oh, there we go. Alright, once you get that readout, as soon as you reach the uh, direction they've instructed you to, in this case 130, this is the point where you go ahead and click this button, which is the AP the approach button. Alright, so we're going to continue to reduce our speed, so let's go ahead and get this down to 200. 
And that's our angry flap noise, so pull the flaps back if it makes that noise. 2500. See, and this is our below glide slope light has slid up, and that's how you want that. That's correct, because you have to intercept the glide slope from below it. But we're going to go ahead and arm our speed brake. There we go. As well as uh, turn on our auto brake here. You can either do one, two, or three. I'm going to go with two this time just because of short visibility. And then you'll see now that we have a couple pink diamonds here. And that's as far as how you're lined up with the uh, glide slope. This is the glide slope diamond. So if the diamond is above you, that means the glide slope's above you. And you'll see as, it, as we get closer to where we need to be, that'll start moving down towards the center. And then this uh, pink diamond, this one is basically your horizontal location as far as how well you're lined up with the runway. Okay, so we can go ahead and put out flaps 10 at this point. And then with the approach button pressed, you'll notice that after it see how the heading just disappeared. So that means that the approach is determined that we need to move. It's moving us either to the left or right to line us up with the uh, runway. So it's doing this all automatically because of the ILS frequency that we dialed in. So let's go ahead and reduce our speed a little further. Let's go ahead and go down to 180. See, and there's no way you're going to be able to do anything right now visually. See, and it's turning us, it's lining us up with the runway right now. And there's the pink diamond right there as far as the horizontal lineup. And sometimes these are going to be not quite dead center, just because sometimes the uh, whatever is emitting the frequency isn't like built in the middle of the runway. So it's not going to be like right dead center always, but it should be pretty close. I think they try and make them as close as possible. Yeah, see, it's a little bit to our left, and it's still the plane's still moving left, so it's still getting lined up here. See, and there it is now. And then as soon as that diamond hits there, you'll see that we start to descend. And again, this is all the approach uh, mode of the plane handling all this. So we can go ahead and reduce our speed again to 160. Pull back the flaps. And there's the runway. So we can go ahead and drop our landing gear. Actually, I want to get our speed down a little further before doing so. going to have a bunch of time here though so we really need to get that speed down one thousand all right go ahead one thousand we put the flap see sometimes the flaps can be a little uh terrain li terrain little tricky too low terrain 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 hmm Terrain, terrain, too low. Terrain. Not sure why it's doing that. Too low. Terrain. Terrain, terrain. Too low. Flaps. Okay. See, it's giving me the flap alarm, even though we're... Okay, there we go. 500. Yeah, definitely start deploying your flaps pretty much all the way to 30 at this point. 400. Okay, landing gear's down, auto brake set. 
So go ahead and kill the autopilot. And then as soon as we touch down, you're going to go ahead and pull the throttle all the way back. 100. Glide slope. 50. 40. 30. Glide slope. And then flare 20, up at 10. the end and start hitting that uh, reverse thrust. And there we go. So go ahead and hit F5 to retract your flaps and then shut off the auto brake. Back to zero. I'm going to go ahead and shut off our taxi light, our runway light, excuse me, and turn on our taxi. Make sure to shut off your strobe light as well. Oops, that's kind of a tough angle. Here we go. So even though they do give you an option for a progressive taxi to the gate they want you to taxi to, I've noticed like half the time that they taxi you, they uh, send you to gates that don't even have jetways to them. So what I like to do is basically uh, just get to the area with all the gates, as you can see they are ahead, and just find an open one. I don't think you have to worry about any uh, virtual FAA coming and banging down your door about doing so, so. And there's an open one right there. That should be perfect. As long as we don't run into anybody. Go ahead and kill your throttle. Pump the brakes gently if need be. Remember the orange square and the red square as far as how to line up properly. A little further. Okay, and then you go ahead and hit Control J, and if the jetway comes out, then you are all set and you're done with your flight. All right, guys. Well, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something here today. And sorry about the uh, landing at the end there. That got a little stressful there for a second, but we were a okay. So. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and run the replay from a uh, external view of the airplane just so you can see as far as what it looked like from the outside as well as the landing so um yeah enjoy that and uh have a great day One thousand. One thousand. Terrain. Terrain. Too low. Terrain.
five hundred. Five hundred. Four hundred. Four hundred. Approaching minimums. Minimums. One hundred. Light slope. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten.